Exactly five years ago, Russia annexed Crimea and began a conflict with Ukraine that's claimed 13,000 lives. But what has Russia gained apart from a host of Western sanctions against it? And will that deter President Putin from flexing his military muscles again? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. Monday, the 18th of March, marks five years since Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. Western countries condemned the move and imposed economic sanctions against Moscow. And coinciding with the anniversary, the EU, the US and Canada have introduced some more. But Putin remains defiant. He's not returning Crimea to Ukraine and has visited the region to join in the celebrations and open two new power stations. Ukraine's foreign minister says the international community will continue to support Ukraine's stance on Crimea. Crimea was taken away from Crimeans. Their homeland was taken away from them. It is well understood that the international community will never recognize this. We feel pain every day for this. But for those Ukrainians who back Russia, there have been celebrations. It is a great, very special day for me. I feel proud for Russia and Crimea. Thank God we are united. A Crimea was gifted to Ukraine by Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev in 1954. When Ukraine became independent in 1991, Russian President Boris Yeltsin agreed it could remain in Ukraine. The region has always been of political and strategic importance to both Moscow and Kiev. It lies on a peninsula between the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov and has a Russian-speaking majority. But many Crimeans support closer ties with the rest of Europe. The Crimean crisis was sparked when Ukraine's then-president, Viktor Yanukovych, turned down a trade deal with the EU and accepted a bailout from Moscow. Three months of street protests followed, leading to Yanukovych's overthrow. Russia refused to recognize the new government in Kiev and within days seized control of the peninsula of Crimea. A referendum considered illegal by the West was held in Crimea, where a majority voted to join Russia. Fighting between Ukrainian forces and Russian-backed separatists began in eastern Ukraine. And although peace accords were signed in February 2015, tensions have remained. Well, let's bring in our guest now to talk more about this. In Kiev, we have Ilya Ponomarov, he is an exiled Russian politician who was the only member of the State Duma to vote against the annexation of Crimea in 2014. In Moscow, international relations and security analyst Mark Sloboda, and in Kiev as well, via Skype, Oleksiy Haran, a professor at the International University of Kiev Moila Academy. Welcome, uh, all three of you. Um, so, Ilya, if I could start with you then. Five years on, how would you assess the state of affairs uh, in Crimea? Is it better off uh, now that the Russians are, are in control? Well, unfortunately, everything that we feared about uh, five years ago that actually uh, happened. Uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, the expectations of people in uh, that territory they didn't uh, fulfill. Um, yeah. They uh, live outside uh, any particular war zone, but at the same time, they are isolated. Uh, their wages have uh, not raised as significantly as they expected it to be. Uh, the uh, tourism is also only Russian internal tourism because there is no international tourism anymore in the peninsula. The thing that uh, uh, Putin sells to them right now is that, look, in Ukraine, still there is a chaos after the revolution, so you are at least outside that chaos, and that's the only thing that sticks them together. Oleksiy Haran, what's your assessment of how Crimea has fared over the last five years? Well, I don't think that uh, we should actually analyze it in <clears throat> economic terms, because in economic terms, I think that everybody lost. Crimea lost in economic terms because it's under sanctions. There are so-called Crimean package of sanctions. Russia lost. Russia lost also because of sanctions. But more importantly, 
Russia lost because it violated important international agreements. And I believe we need to start from that. Because in 1994, Ukraine refused to have nuclear arsenal, which was the third largest in the world, in return for the guarantees of its territorial integrity. And these guarantees were given by United States, the UK, and Russia. So Russia violated it. Russia violated also Russian-Ukrainian Treaty of 1997. And it means, actually, what happened with Crimea, it was the first annexation in Europe after World War II. So basically, for your listeners and, uh, to, and uh, <clears throat> viewers to understand what happened with Crimea, it's like Saddam Hussein who seized Kuwait. He said, this is our territory. And this is exactly the argument which Putin used. He said, this is our territory, so despite all the international laws, I am seizing it. And first, he denied Russian military presence there. It was a total lie. He said, no, there are no uh, Russian soldiers there. But then, in a year, he openly recognized it. So I believe what we, when we are talking about Crimea, we need to understand that this is the overthrow of the whole international order. And that's why the sanctions came against, uh, against Russia. We also need to remember the position of Crimean Tatars, because Crimean Tatars is a native people, as a native people of Crimea. They wanted to stay with Ukraine, but no, Russia didn't take it into account. And now you have 100 political prisoners of Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, who are in Russian, who are in Russian prisons. You have 20 Crimean Tatars activists who were killed. 20 were disappeared. So what Russia installed in Crimea is actually kind of totalitarian, continuation of totalitarian regime. This is a total suppression of the people, whatever their ethnic origin is, Ukrainian, Russian, or Crimean Tatar. All right. Mark Sloboda, I suspect uh, your take on all of this is going to be somewhat different from what we've just heard from Ilya and Alexei. What is your view? Yeah, I can't really agree with about anything they said. Uh, first of all, full disclosure, my wife is Crimean. My mother-in-law lives in Simferopol. I'm in Crimea every few months, and uh, we have family all across East Ukraine, Kharkov, uh, Odessa, and Donbass. Uh, so first of all, uh, the majority of Crimeans, 72 percent by the most recent polls, disagree completely with our previous two guests' assessment, and they say their lives are better. Um, 93 percent of Crimeans, uh, about the same as during the original reunification referendum, continue to support reunification. This is uh, confirmed by polls, international polls, uh, Pew, Gallup, GFK. It shows clearly the will of the Crimean people. Uh, secondly, um, our colleague Alexei brought up international order and the Budapest Memorandum. He might have mentioned that the Budapest Memorandum not only guarantees Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity, uh, but also non-interference in its affairs. And certainly, the openly uh, West-backed Maidan putsch, which violently and unconstitutionally overthrew the last legitimate, democratically elected Ukrainian government, uh, meets that and renders that treaty moot at that time. Um, and Russian support for uh, reunification continues uh, uh, near 80 um, percent. So, uh, on this side of the thing, both Crimeans and Russians are happy to be reunified, and their lives have gotten uh, in Crimea immeasurably better. I want to bring up the point, though, uh, Mark Sloboda, that uh, uh, Alexei made earlier there about uh, President Putin's denial initially that there were any Russian troops uh, in Crimea at first, and then much later uh, pretty much acknowledged it, and, and that there is, there is a deficit. Uh, of trust there with President Putin, and this is one of the issues with 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 the with the breaking of the of the international order. What do you say to that? Well, I, I think that's a blatant misunderstanding of the situation in Crimea, because in Crimea, at the time of the West-backed Maidan putsch, which overthrew the Ukrainian government, there were some 25,000 Russian troops by treaty at Russian naval bases in the Crimea. So, of course, there were Russian troops in Crimea. 
But why did he deny them? Why did he deny it at first then? What he denied is that Russian troops were actively involved in arranging the referendum in the country. This was done through largely through militias uh, uh, that were uh, uh, organized just like uh, the Putsch battalions uh, were organized uh, in the west of the country that overthrew the government in Kiev. Ilya uh, Ponomarev, what, what do you say to that? Well, I think uh, the situation is pretty obvious that, uh, firstly, uh, we now know this clearly, and Mr. Putin personally has confirmed it, that, firstly, uh, the occupation happened, and only then the referendum, the so-called referendum, was staged. And currently it's irrelevant what were the polls and what were the public opinion in, in this regard, because all this public opinion was formed after the actual occupation happened. And that's the bottom line of this whole process. So in the situation when uh, the troops would be withdrawn, there would be uh, no occupation, no foreign military on this territory. And currently, when they live in the controlled environment, and we know that Russia is not the most democratic country on Earth. Uh, when, when you say, sorry, Dinro, when you say it's a controlled environment about, uh, in, in Crimea, what do you mean by that? I mean that uh, uh, the number of police forces uh, on this territory has dramatically increased. Uh, we know about already more than 100 cases of political prisoners on that territory. We know the struggle that Crimean Tatars are holding against uh, the occupants. So uh, uh, obviously this is not a free uh, territory. And in general, in Russia, there are a lot of restrictive laws, restricts freedom of speech, uh, freedom of internet, freedom of communication. Everything is controlled, so people are simply afraid. All right, let's, let's put that point back to Mark Sloboda then. There have been numerous accounts uh, from inside Crimea of, of crackdowns on dissent and uh, intimidation and, and, and so on. Uh, for, for anyone who ex expresses uh, disagreement with the, with, with the majority view, and particularly uh, minority uh, Tatars, which is the, the point that uh, Alexei made earlier, and uh, what, uh, what rights groups have said is a sister ha systematic harassment uh, of Tatars going on in uh, Crimea since, uh, since the Russian annexation five years ago. What do you say to that? Uh, yeah, well, well, first of all, uh, Mr. Ponomarev can deny agency to the Crimean uh, people all he wants. Uh, I, I think he should visit himself uh, if he wasn't, of course, uh, uh, wanted for fraud, embezzlement, and, and dereliction of duties uh, in Russia. I, I guess he could probably not visit so freely with those criminal charges hanging over his head. Um, but um, if you don't want to believe international polls on the subject, um, then, um, and if we assume that this, as it was suggested, was is under some kind of coercion that the Crimean people would all change their mind if there were no Russians there, the majority of the Crimeans being ethnic Russians, then I guess we should result, uh, reverse the results of the West Bank Maidan Putsch government in Kiev that happened just a few months beforehand. Uh, and reverse that and see if the majority of Ukrainians want their government overthrown, because polls at that time showed the majority of Ukrainians were against the Maidan. And this was repeated during the three months of that overthrow of, uh, of the government uh, backed by the West and in, in Kiev. As, as for the Crimean Tatars, the Crimean Tatars are not a political monolith. Uh, polls by Levada, the, the uh, uh, independent pollster critical of the Russian government, has shown that a plurality of Crimean Tatars uh, feel that the reunification was the right thing to do. And this is a few cases of genuine extremists uh, from the uh, self-declared, self-elected Majlis, uh, which does have a number of members, unfortunately, with extremist uh, ties uh, that is supported by the regime uh, now in Kiev. Um, and I, I think uh, certainly the genuine cases of persecution are far less than the hundreds and hundreds of Ukrainians that have been picked off the street by the Putsch SBU, as UN reports and Human Rights Watch have detailed, 
tortured in prisons, often uh, simply for being East Ukrainians, other times for making Facebook or Twitter posts. If you want to see a real totalitarian regime with extreme far-right tendencies, I'm afraid you have to look towards West-backed Kiev regime. All right, let's put some of that back then to uh, Alexei in uh, Kiev. What Mark Sloboda was saying there um, about the issue of the Tatars in, uh, uh, in uh, Crimea and that uh, many of them were, were, were so-called extremists. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to that? Well, it's very difficult to have such a dialogue because what Mr. Sloboda is doing, actually, he is... Uh, it's not in line with the facts, you know. It's total, uh, it's total Kremlin propaganda, you know. Total Kremlin propaganda. Let's start with so-called Western-backed putsch, as uh, Mr. Sloboda said. Yes, this was a national movement, and this is, a, it was originated in Ukraine for democracy of Ukraine. And Mr. Yanukovych, if you know, he was ousted by Ukrainian parliament who restored the constitution, which Yanukovych violated. So it was, he was voted down by Ukrainian parliament. If you do not know the facts, these are the facts. Now, after that, Crimea was occupied. What vote and was again, that? What, what vote was that? Occupation, <laughs> occupation of Ukraine, part of Ukraine, starting from Crimea and then Eastern Ukraine, has nothing to do with domestic changes in Ukraine. Because, again, Russia violated all the international treaties which Russia signed. And this is recognized by international community. Um, it's important also the so-called polls, you know, which were done under the barrel of the gun. Ukraine is a democracy. It's recognized. You cannot go against the facts. We have free elections in Ukraine. It's not a, it's not a <laughs> police regime that you have in Russia. You are smiling, but 13,000 Ukrainians are killed by Russian soldiers and Russian weapons. Let me remind you also that Crimean Tatars in 1944 they were deported from Crimea by Stalin. They were sent to Siberia and Central Asia. And the only possibility to have uh, to come back appeared in 1990 and in independent Ukraine. Crimean Tatar movement was always non-violent. If you do not know the facts, consult the fact books. Majlis is the body which was elected and is elected by the whole Crimean Tatar population. Elected by who? Again, this is right. and let me completely by false. Crimean false. Tatars. And let false. me just and let me just false. finally add that Russia is continuing its aggression, not only in Crimea, not only in uh, eastern Ukraine, but also in the Azov Sea. Actually, according to against Russian-Ukrainian treaty on Azov Sea. Russia blocks Ukrainian ships, not only naval ships, but also commercial ships right. Let's to get... go to the Azov Sea. And finally, Ukrainian ship was detained and was shelled in neutral waters. And 24 Ukrainian navals, they are now in Moscow in prison. So basically what Russia is doing in the Azov Sea Right. They're pirates. Let's get, you know. let's get, so let's get Mark's, let's get Mark Sloboda's uh, response to that. Mark. Yeah, I, I, I'm just uh, flabbergasted by his assessment of so-called elections in Ukraine as being democratic. I mean, this was the overthrow of a government. The majority of Ukrainians confirmed by polls reported in the pro-American, American-owned Kiev Post said that the majority of Ukrainians were against the uh, Maidan. That, that is, uh, it was a, a slim lie. majority, 50, uh, 51, 45 percent. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, your, your viewers can check that online at the Kiev Post and the polls recorded there themselves. And I invite you to do the same if you are ignorant of the facts. Second of all, we see elections by this West-backed regime in, in uh, Kiev that is literally not only under the barrel of a gun, but under fire of grad missile launchers as the regime attempts to subjugate the people of East Ukraine uh, to their seizure of power in Kiev. We have the last 
A ruling government's party has been lustrated and pogromed out of existence. Every leftist party in the country was banned. Right? And you want to call these free right. elections? I, I don't know what your standard of a democratic and free election is. <laughs> This is a lie. Three Everything communist you parties seen. in Ukraine have been banned. Do you deny that? Do you deny that? <laughs> no, listen. To, listen, in, in two hours, I am going for discussion because we have elections in Ukraine. And elections in Ukraine are free, <clears throat> contrary to what you have in Russia and what you are defending. You are defending police regimes. So, among the candidates, and it's public debate on television, there, there would be representatives of the left party. Mr. Moroz, for example, who was founder of a socialist party of Ukraine. So basically, I would like to add, I would like to add, again, what you are saying is just, you know, repeating Kremlin propaganda. What I'm right. saying is based on international assessment of international organizations. We had a lot of polls. I'm also representing sociological companies, and okay, I'm all get, polls show just that the, Ukrainians condemn. Okay, just in, just in the couple of minutes, Russian just in the couple of minutes we have left, I want I want to get uh, Ilya's uh, word on this, on 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 what we've just been hearing, and I want to ask you as well, Ilya, about this uh, accusation from from Moscow that um, uh, what happened in Ukraine. Uh, in, in, in 2014, uh, in, in which uh, Yanukovych was, uh, was removed, was, was not, this, this was not a democratically elected government. This, is what, this was essentially uh, a putsch. What do you say to that? Well, of course, there was a revolution on the streets. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the winning revolution is called the revolution. The failed revolution is called the coup. So uh, Moscow pretends to uh, name what happens on the streets of uh, Kiev as a coup, uh, uh, as an artificial overthrow of uh, the legitimate government. Uh, I, my take on this is a revolution, and in Ukraine it's called revolution of dignity. And I think that uh, this term is actually pretty accurate, and what we see uh, is firstly that uh, this revolution did not remove the uh, uh, legitimately uh, elected parliament, even after uh, Yanukovych fled uh, the, the country. Uh, he fled the country, by the way, absolutely on his own. Uh, uh, nobody was chasing him. He was just afraid uh, of uh, people on Maidan. That's why he decided to run. And uh, then in less than uh, I was three afraid months of them too. after what happened on Maidan, uh, Ukraine has elected a new president, and this uh, president was legitimately elected, and uh, pro-Moscow forces uh, received very little support. Actually, even uh, what Moscow always tries to say that uh, Ukraine has been governed by the nationalists, but uh, even the nationalists also got very little support. The uh, candidate of nationalists in the elections of 2014 received something like 3% of the votes, and in the upcoming elections, what we would see in uh, just uh, uh, 10 days from now, uh, most likely the result would be even lower than that. All right, that is going to have to be the last word. Uh, fortunately, we're out of time. I want to uh, appreciate uh, uh, you all for coming in. Uh, Ilya Ponomarev, uh, Mark Sloboda, and uh, Oleksiy Haran, thanks very much uh, for being with us. It's been a good discussion. And thank you, as always, for watching. You can see this program again anytime by going to our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, there's our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Sika and the whole team here, bye for now.